That's right, that's right. What up, everybody? This is What's Good Phoenix. I'm your host, Aware. And I'm DJ Tranzo. And we have a very special guest for you guys today, man. Uh, you know, he, he, he is here in town. It's been a while since I've seen him. And uh, we're very, very lucky to have you here, man. Great to have you here, brother. So, uh, introducing... My oh, man, Luke Dorsett. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Yes. Welcome, man. Welcome. Welcome Thanks for brother. coming out, man. I appreciate it for sure. Thank you, you know? for having me. It's an honor. Yes. Um, let's start from the beginning, man. You know, like, uh, where were you born? Where are you from? All right. Um, I was born in uh, Brownsville, Texas, originally. It's in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a border town uh, to Matamoros. And um, it's, a lot of people say it's a dangerous place because uh, of all the golf stuff going on but uh, for me that's that's originally my home and uh, it's beautiful i saw a family there and um yeah and since then I've, I've basically been a nomad all over the place yeah i i see that you man i i didn't know exactly where you were from originally because i see you've got connections all over the place that you've been living all over the world actually yeah not just uh not just here but all over the world so yeah hopefully we can touch on on some of that you know yeah absolutely yeah. it's been a minute man it's been a minute since i i've seen you we were uh talking before the podcast on how long it's been since i've uh i've seen luke uh i met him in uh 2018 introduced um uh, by um uh, mochacha uh rest in peace, rest in peace. Yep. Uh, rest and in peace. uh that that specific uh specific day um my life like was changed till this day man um just with the the documentary uh, the low and slow documentary that you had out man still resonate resonates with me today um of all the information with uh you know the low rider culture that is in uh, N uh nagoya J japan that you documented and it just man it, it was something else it, it was a really great piece that you did uh it was in uh, scottsdale uh i believe right yeah scottsdale museum of contemporary arts of all places yeah yeah that, that was great <laughs> man i i think uh as far as like, you know, sitting there and just amazed and just how I was taken into that world of the, the low water culture that that um, that Japan is inspired from and to see the cars, the paint job, the culture, it was just amazing, you know, um, to see and stuff like that. So uh, briefly, man, if you could talk a little bit about it, you know, what I mean, like it's something that you just can't find. It's a gem. Uh, that you can't just, you know, look so, for. So it, for people who don't know Luke, I mean, you know, a lot of us, a lot of his friends and homies, yeah. we all know Luke, you know, he's, he's the homie. But if you don't know Luke, like, you know, can you give a, a quick rundown about who Mr. Luke is um, to somebody who who doesn't know, who doesn't know you, you know, like, sure. what are we here talking about? Like, you know, what, what you got going on, you know? Yeah. So, um, so I'm Luke Dorsett, like I said, originally from Brownsville, Texas. I'm the artist. Um, I do, I do visual art as well as uh, I do music, been in the music game for a while as well. So I do film, photography, music. Uh, I do martial arts also. So I love that art. Right. I'm an art lover. Oh. Um, an art lover, not an art fighter. But um, as far as this project and, and what, what they're talking about here, I originally started that back in 2001. Uh, I took a trip to Japan and uh, I, you know, I had heard that the culture existed there. And uh, I took the long route, man. I, I started in uh, Eastern Europe, kind of made my way over to Asia. So it, was, it, it took me months to get there, but it was a blast. And um, by the time I got there, I uh, ended up in Hiroshima, Japan. And I was leaving a, I was leaving a bar. And I was with this girlfriend I had at the time, second night in Hiroshima. And, um, you know, I'm kind of stumbling now. We're, we're buzzed. You know, as, as most 21 year olds are when you're out of the country and you're having a good time. <laughs> so I, there's a 7 Eleven. I, I, I got hungry. I was like, I get some food or something. And uh, there's these two dudes out, you know, with their car. And it's like a 62, I think it's 64 or 62 Impala. It was 64, actually. And the top's down, the keys are in the ignition. The dudes just walk in the convenience store. And I'm like, just shocked. Like, first off, how are you going to leave that car running with the keys in it? You know, this was here. <laughs> it, it would be gone. Two seconds, right? Anyways, uh, I'm like, I don't want to follow these dudes in there. I'm going to wait for them to come out. So I, they come, you know, 10 minutes or five minutes past, whatever. It was a while. They were in there for a while. They come out, and I go up to them, and they're, like, freaked out. 
like, who the hell is this guy talking to us? You know, my Japanese wasn't very good at the time. I speak really well now, but back then it wasn't very good. I had a shaved head, so I looked different, you know, but they looked a lot like me. Yeah. They had baggy clothes. They had dark skin. I, they could have fit right in here, man. I mean, wow. obviously, the early 2000s, they could have fit right in here. Nobody would have known the difference. Um, and they, you know, they, I, got, I communicated with them enough, and they gave me a number of the builder uh, who sold them the car. Mm -hmm. And they said he speaks a little bit of English. And so I, I called the guy and, and uh, got his number, and I went to his shop and became friends with them and snowballed into a really um, a lot more than I ever really had imagined. Um, and it turns out he's actually one of the best builders in Japan. So that kind of fell into place too. Um, so as far as my identity goes, Tranzo, let's go back to that question. Yeah. Um, that's a huge part of my identity. Uh, low writing is, and, and, and this movement that's been happening all over the world. And uh, so I, I am an artist. I do visual art. I do music. Um, I'm a low rider myself. So I have a 64 Super Sport. I've had for a very long time. And um, that's who I am. And I guess an all around good guy, depending who you ask. You know? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're all like that. It just depends on, depends who, who, you on who you ask, you know? <laughs> so um, how, did, how did you end up in Phoenix? That is a, a interesting question, man. So in the 90s, I came here. Uh, my family actually moved here. And, uh, you know, I came along for the ride and uh, went to school for a couple of years out here. Went to university and then, uh, and then I dipped out and I uh, went and saw the world. Um, you know, we come back and forth. And, you know, usually for music, I'd come back into town and I, you know, I would play these gigs. Um, with these guys from Tijuana, played electronic music. And, yeah, uh, I want to talk about uh, Nortec. Yeah, Nortec Collective. Uh, yeah. Fusible and Bastich, uh, were who I would tour with and play gigs with here. Um, and then, you know, like I, around 2000 and uh, 2009, so around there, I kind of was like, you know, when you're an artist, sometimes you, you got to do other jobs. It's hard. It's hard to just make money off of art until you really hit. And I was really like sick of working. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, I'm going to just give this a shot and just do the art thing full time, do the DJ thing and use my talents to, you know, apply myself to use these talents that I have. And so that's what I'm going to do. I ended up uh, I'd save some money. And, you know, gutted my house, sold my car, sold my bikes. I, I, I did all that and then um, took off to Japan. And I was like, man, I need to, I need to get on this and uh, and get some more footage and shoot some more stuff for my film, and and that's what I did. Um, I hadn't I didn't have a place necessarily scoped out where I was going to rent or where I was going to live, but these these cats that I hung out with back in the day from a city called Chiba, right outside Tokyo, it's like a bedroom city to Tokyo. Chiba is actually one of the I think one of the meccas for low riding in Japan. There's a, couple, there's, like, there's a couple other cities that are like the Mecca for different kinds of cars. Like Nagoya would be bombs, like, you know, 30s through 50s cars. Oh. But Chiba and Yokohama and a couple other cities, I mean, they're known for having like Impalas and Cadillacs and Hopin and Three Wheel and all the, all the fun stuff, you know. <clears throat> and so I ended up going to Chiba one night to visit my friends. And we went to Yokohama, the city I was talking about, because everybody likes to go there. And um, end of the night, I'm, I'm coming back, and uh, and the homie was like, oh, yeah, where are you crashing? And I was like, I was just going to get a hotel room and just hop on a train the next day and uh, go to another city. And he goes, oh, well, you can just crash at my place. And I was like, cool. So I crashed at his place. And uh, this dude's like my brother, so I've already known him for like you know, a really long time at this point. He's like, I was like, hey, I'm going to rent an apartment here, man. He's like, no, don't waste your money. Just stay here. Just stay here with us. So I ended up staying there and um, was there for about six months. And uh, I lived in the, you know, sometimes I'd sleep in the office, sometimes I'd sleep in the apartment, depending if you had to check over or not, you know. <laughs> he was single at the time. So <laughs> it was a little, you know, nobody had kids. Nobody was married back then. And um, the Loretta uh, garage was about 100 feet from the window of the apartment that we were in. 
So his his factory or garage or his shop was right there. Wow. So I spent all that, you know, all day I would spend at the at the shop with them. I was learning stuff, doing stuff. And um was able to keep afloat because uh there's a lot of customers that wanted cars and I was able to locate those cars for them and, and ship some stuff over for them, some cars and other things. Um that year I actually I, I uh I spent a lot of time in other cities as well. So, you know, Hiroshima, which is actually the first city that I ever been to, and Nagoya several times, and North Japan, Yokohama, Osaka. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I did the whole thing. My visa was going to run up in Japan, so I went to Taiwan, hung out there, linked up with some lowrider friends, came back to Japan. Wow. Uh, stayed longer, and then um, ended up... Uh, Ended up in L.A. I'd lived in L.A. before, but I ended up in L.A. with some of my friends from Los Angeles Car Club and uh, stayed with them. And um, I had, had an invite to go to Brazil because there was a Japanese Brazilian uh, by the name of Sergio that uh, I met in Chiba a long time ago. And he had, he had gotten himself in some trouble, a little bit of trouble in Japan and had to go back to Brazil. But he kept saying, come over to Brazil, come over to Brazil, man. And uh you know, right before I, I took off to uh, to Brazil, I ended up um, going to Soul Assassin's studio. If you guys know who Soul Assassins are, mm-hmm. and um, my friend introduced me to uh, Esteban Oriol, uh, photographer, mm-hmm. and so I uh, you know I met Esteban and and uh, and they were like, hey, he's, this guy's going to Brazil tomorrow, and he's like, you're going to Brazil, and I was like, yeah. He's like, I'm gonna go to Brazil next week. I was like, where are you going to be at? He's like, Rio. I was like, well, I'll be in Sao Paulo. So if you're around, stop over. I'll link up with you. He was like, cool. Really cool guy, man. Super humble. We ended up shooting a bunch of stuff in Sao Paulo together. Oh, dope. All over the place. You know, favelas, everywhere, you name it. And it was cool. Um, so I, I'm in Brazil for about three months. I couldn't renew my visa. So I left and went back to L.A. My family had... Uh, they had moved. They had moved a couple times, and they were in um, Fountain Hills, actually, which is outside of uh, it's outside of Phoenix, kind of far from here. But my sister um, had got a place, and uh, I was like, "All right, well, I need to I need to post up for a minute." So I, you know, I crashed in Phoenix, and um, my visa fell through in Brazil. So I ended up like, "All right, I'm in." It's either go back to LA or or stay in Arizona where you got some family. And I was like, well, I'm going to stay with my family for a little bit. I haven't seen everybody for a while. And uh, I stayed put for a minute. And the next thing you know, you know, I got a job in a in an art gallery, framing uh, photos and and fine art, I guess. And um, yeah, I made some money, got myself a little little house over there on Ninth Street between Van Buren and Roosevelt which was uh, not the best area at the time, but um, kind of built it up from there. And I got my 64, and that's how I ended up in uh, Phoenix. What, what, what year did you live over there? Um, I landed there in uh, 2011, right at the beginning of the year. All right, so it wasn't that bad around there no more. Well, I mean, I guess it's about, about half and half. It's about half but, and half. But, but, you know, um, that's just the old hood right there. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. I, I always call it pre-, pre uh, Pre gentrification. Uh, Pre gentrification. Yeah. So the art, the, the Roosevelt art, art walk. You know that was all the, the barrio before that. Yeah. And um and so I guess that was around twenty two thousand. How mm-hmm. things started mm-hmm. to change around there. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that's why I was asking. Now everybody wants to go there. Now that's the destination. Oh, now. Yeah. I yeah. you know I I used to I used to pop in here in um in the mid two thousands and um go down to Roosevelt and there were some really really good bands over there. I, I don't know if you remember Fatigo. They were a really good band. Mm-hmm. And there was there's a bunch of uh, good bands around the time, and um, you know, Lost Leaf was like a really great spot right there on Fifth Street. Yeah, and mm-hmm. um, there's 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 a lot of really cool little spots, but everything else was boarded up. Yeah, it was. It, I mean, they had the the, the original Joe Bots. Yeah, on Fifth Street, yeah. right Joe there Bot too. There. Um, I got a funny story about that building, but yeah. that's a way back thing. I got a bunch of stories on yeah. that place, but it was <laughs> no, like, I mean, it, it, this was like in the eighties before it was even. Oh wow! Yeah, no, it was no. it was funny. But but the thing was is that the neighborhood and that whole thing was it was still kind of edgy, yeah. In those in those mid two thousands, I think like when I moved in, it was like twenty eleven. It was still a little edgy, and they still had some bad pockets in the neighborhood and stuff. And people knew if you weren't from there, 
I made friends right away with people and it was cool, but there was still a lot of crap going on over there. And um, I, I feel like, you know, when I moved out of there, I feel like we got the best years out of it that we could. I think all of us that hung out downtown did, you know, those mid 2000s to about yeah. then where it's like the best years probably. And then now it's all investors and everything else, man. Yeah. It's kind of different. Yeah, I mean, everything grows and changes and you have to en en enjoy the great things while they're there, I guess you would say, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. Uh, nothing lasts forever. You know, if you're having a good time, look around and appreciate it because that's, that's right. not going to be there. Gone. A little later on, so um, I wonder if we all thought that when we were young. I don't know if we did. I, mean, I, we, did. I, I know, I know, we were having fun. I know yeah. we were having fun, though. So, I, I, so you're working on a movie, right? So, yeah. to, let's let's get it to where everybody who once again, everybody who doesn't know, yeah, Luke's working on a documentary work, a movie about the lowrider culture influence on in the different countries in the of the world. Yeah, that's that's correct. Pretty much, am I am I, am I right about that? You got it spot so, on. When I when I first met Luke, it was at the Sagrado when we had the Sagrado. It was maybe like twenty twelve or thirteen. Yeah, I think so, I think that's when I first met you. You were doing a, sh a photography show there, and I was introduced to you as as a photographer, um, mainly as a photographer who traveled around documenting the lowrider culture in in different co in different countries. Yeah, and then I learned that you. Then I learned you were in Nortec <laughs> because I I had already knew who Nortec was. Nortec was in my crates, honestly. So um, I was like, bro, that's 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 dope, man. Because Nor Nortec to me was uh, was a, a dope as breakthrough um, electronic group. Yeah. That under my from what I understood, they used a lot of um, banda samples mm. to make electronic music. That that was an interesting uh, that was an interesting ride right there. I thought it was dope, man. When I first heard it, I was like, <laughs> "Man, this is this is dope." I, I really liked it. I really dug it a lot. And uh, so when I learned that you were part of the original Nortec group, I thought that was very impressive for for sure. And then I just had like a ton of questions after that. I asked yeah. them, you know, like, "What's what? How did you do it?" You know? So for those music music people, <laughs> you know, I, I I believe Mello gave me the first Nortec CD. That's really cool. Yeah. You know, because Melo and I trade music forever. So um, can you touch about how Nortec came about? Because I know there's a few people who would know know Nortec. And I know yeah, um, yeah. I and, 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 and how that came about and how, how what the role you played in that. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, they were at the, um, last time they were in town. Yeah, close. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The last time uh, they were in town, it was... I had a birthday party. I, um, they played at the Crescent Ballroom. They came over and uh, we had a cake and everybody hung out. It was a little small private party. Um, how did that come about? That was funny, man. I uh, I had heard about him in Time Magazine. I think this was in like 99 or 2000. And I thought, man, I'm making this music. I'm making some music. I'm going to send them a demo. You know, like everybody does, right? Yeah. Everybody sends a, the record label a demo and says, Hey, listen to my stuff. And I had sent my I had sent my demo out to Moonshine and I don't know how many other labels and just got the letter, like, we're not accepting new artists right now, that kind of stuff. Man, well, at least you got a letter back. Man, yeah. Some of us didn't get none back, you know. Oh man. I know it. But I for some reason I thought I gotta keep on these guys. I gotta keep I gotta keep bugging them, you know. So I um I ended up getting Pepe Mo was one of the founders of the of the group. I ended up getting his his personal email address somehow, <laughs> and I and I was calling their label like almost every day. He finally writes me back, and he says, "Hey, re we really liked your demo, but we're a new label, and we don't have a lot of money to sign artists right now. But let's keep in touch." And I was like, "Okay, cool." So I kept emailing back and forth. And he started sending me songs that he hadn't finished yet. They weren't released. And I'd started sending him samples and other stuff, too. So he started, kind of started trading stuff. He eventually uh, invites me down to Tijuana to um, an album release party um, called the Tijuana Beat Shop. It's, you'll, it, there's, there's, always, there's, there's Tijuana Volume 1 and there's Tijuana Sessions Volume 3. There's no 2. You can look everywhere. It doesn't exist. <laughs> so 2 is actually... The, the Beat Shop is actually number two, but oh, it was okay. never released on Palm Pictures. It was released on a different label, and you won't be able to find it. It's uh, a limited edition. You can always kick you down a copy if you want, though, man. You know I do want a copy, yeah. man. Um, so uh, so we, we traded more samples there, and 
just kind of became friends, uh, honestly. And then um, he, I, I said to him one day, I said, you know, we're going to do this, this show in Phoenix. And I know you do visuals. And I have um, our chaos. I had some other gear. And I said, why don't I just be like your VJ and do the visuals for you while you play? And he was like, okay, cool. So we did this gig. There's about 1,200 people that came. Uh -huh. I wasn't expecting that at all. <clears throat> and then we did another gig at Sky Lounge, like after that, shortly after. Um, I started catching the attention of Boss Deitch, who was the, you know, the, considered the godfather of Nortec. Um, and he, you know, started kind of like, well, who's this guy? You know, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? You know? And, um, we ended up, I was in Mexico city. We're at a festival and he comes up to me. And I remember this. He goes, um, Hey, listen, here's my card. Call me next time you're in Tijuana. I'm, I'm doing some, some stuff. I'd like you to come check it out. And I was like, shit. Okay, man. So I do that. He ends up becoming my teacher. Wow. Teaching me Ableton Live. So I'm going a couple times a month. And well, that's an early Ableton days, right? Yeah, we we're like an Ableton 5 or something yeah. back then, 4 or 5, maybe even earlier. But Ableton's yeah. the, the music composing software. Yeah, mm. it's a digital audio workstation. Yeah. and, and uh, like a DAW, can, yeah. You can, you can mix with it also if you have a controller and, and stuff hooked up to it. So it ends up teaching me a bunch of stuff on Ableton. And... The other guys are kind of like, what's going on? Why, why is this guy, why is he around? Because I'm, yeah. I'm not from Tijuana, right? And yeah. So there was original, you know, like collective members. Um, and and so we're, fast forward like six months. I'm in Rosarito. Uh, we're all there. Um, and he, he comes up to me and he was like, I was like, hey, you know, me and Pepe just did this gig. Me and Pepe just did this really cool gig. You should come to Phoenix sometime and, and, and play. I'll do your visuals or whatever, you know. And he goes, no. He goes, I want you actually to play. He wow. goes, I, I want you to play. He goes, you're good. Wow. And I kind of was like, oh, shit. All right. Step up my game then. I got to get even better then if I'm going to play next to this dude. So we did the gig, uh, and it was amazing. It was the night before Thanksgiving. Um, Where at? It was at Sky Lounge. Uh, Pablo was there actually showing his art off. He used to make these, uh, rest in peace, Pablo. But yeah, rest make, in peace, Pablo. Peace. He used to make these like purses with, uh, I don't remember. The, uh, the pato cans. There you go. The yeah. Pato, yeah. Yeah. And the bracelets and, and stuff. And the bracelets. Yeah. yeah. So he was there. I remember he was like downstairs and he had his whole thing set up. And uh, there was a video of it floating around somewhere. I'm not sure where it is. Um, but we, we, I mean, we just, we killed it. Uh, Ramon and I killed it. Uh, was one of the teacher. shows I didn't get to see, man. Um, and then it started. Uh, I started doing gigs with uh, Pepe or Ramon or both of them. So we started touring, and then um, I started getting booked uh, by the label uh, to do shows for them. So like one year there was a Cinco de Mayo. Um, Dos Equis was funding a Cinco de Mayo party, and it was like all over the country. And there wasn't enough members to play. And so they're like, yeah, Luke, you're on. You're, you're going to. Luke, you're an official member. You're, 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 you're going you're gonna to play in, in lieu of uh, the original members here because. Did they think that you're one of the original members when you were playing? Um, I, I'm not sure people knew the difference, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, like I, the old, it's like the old, uh, um, who is it? Uh? Well, Sonora Dinamita. I mean, how many members have they had? Well, they had a bunch of, oh, yeah, they had a ton, a, yeah. a few different singers and a bunch of band members i might not know the difference unless i did a show with them and i met the the, the composer oh they're amazing i, I met him oh once. yeah it was one of the best shows and then the the composer was he was older he was an older guy and he was uh he was actually really cool yeah i mean i, I talked to him i was djing the show and um when he was up there he was just cool man like i would talk to him and he was like yeah 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 man and i'm like you wrote that and he's like yeah and uh yeah, you would think that he'd be like, "Yeah, well, don't talk to me" or something. But yeah. he was he was real cool, dude. I gotta I gotta give him props, you know. I don't remember his name, but um, look on the look on the record, look on the credits. That's the dude I talked to. That's the guy. Yeah, no, he was cool. There, it was an amazing show, dude. It was an amazing show, but got sidetracked. But no, no, it's a, no, no, music's important. Yeah. Man. So, so the the guys, um, you know, they, 
but there's a lot of stuff that happens in the music industry and so people get locked into uh, record deals and you got to produce x amount of records under a contract or you get in trouble or you got to pay money back so there's a lot of stuff there's a lot of stuff going on like that at the time i don't want to go into too many specifics but um some members were producing more than others you know and so they had to not break up, but people did kind of go their own ways to produce their own material mm-hmm. um, to fulfill the contract. And so I was really lucky to be able to tour with with uh, Bossy Chimfusible for a while. I think there was some other um, not animosity, but I think a lot of the other guys were kind of like, "Why, why aren't you bringing us along on tour all the time with you?" Um, but we were getting booked, and I mean that's just that's how it works sometimes, you know. They want to see certain talent and hear certain mixes, and that's what you get. You know, people get invited to do that. Um, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, you got to do. You got to be you, and you got to perform the way you do, and people want it. That's 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 dope. But I I can I can say that like as far as as that whole experience, I mean, it was amazing um, just to be able to be on the same stage as um for, uh, for them to take me under their wing. Yeah, for and, sure, and man. What an accomplishment, man! Like you Thank know, you. yeah. I, I, and I, I, what an experience! I mean, just the, st- I'm sure, just a little bit. You told me it was, yeah, that was that was amazing, but there's got to be stories and stories, you know. Well, well I, I didn't have to get jumped in or anything. I mean, you, know, <laughs> yeah. I was able you just to, you just had to make music. I I, I had to, I had to make some music and 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 show myself here, uh, prove prove a little bit of uh, what I could do, and, um, you know, as far as like uh, being credited, um, I would say that is. I would say that I was I was a, a member on those nights when I played those gigs and when I was uh, up there on stage and when I was touring. Yeah, I would say so too. Um, yeah, and, and, and you know, and and Bus Each would say the same thing. I think um, maybe not the other members, but I mean, uh, Bus Each is his workout, so that's cool. Yeah, I, no, I mean that's that's dope, man. So um, anybody who wants to check out Nortec, oh please do. Um, look look it up. N O N O R T E C. Right. Yep. You can start with Nortec, Nortec Collective. Nortec Collective again, and their electronic music um, with most a lot of banda norteño samples. Yeah. Um, re- very Mexican infused electronic music. Um, dope, real dope. So yeah, you know, congrats on congrats on that whole experience because oh, yeah. um, you you can't you can't buy those things, you know. Well, that was a ride, definitely. I I, I played in um, played in uh, downtown Sydney, Australia. Uh, I've played in Tokyo several times. Yeah, I, times. I know. I mean, they were they were pretty big at the time, and yeah. can imagine the, the the gigs you guys got. You know, so. they, they got some. I mean, I I I thought my gigs were cool. I mean, those gigs that those guys got uh, when I wasn't there were amazing too. I mean, I saw videos and was like, man, you know, the the most I've ever had is a couple thousand people. These guys are playing Viva Latino with like I don't know how many tens of thousands of people. Yeah, those are crazy gigs to do too, man. I mean, to do when you have those big crowds, that when, kind of energy. When you were, um, because you've traveled a lot, yeah. Did you ever stop and just say, "Damn, you know, my my passion for the love of the Lord of culture or music has got me there"? You know what I mean? Like, yes, this is amazing. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I, I get to live my gift and my passion, and you know, I'm in Australia, you know, Japan, traveling. I've I've definitely felt that before. Um, I've also felt the wear uh, of, of living out of a suitcase, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah worn down that too. by that. But yeah, I felt like that. I think the most recent time I felt like that was um, it was probably in Mexico in this last year. So I, like I, like I said earlier, I I was I spent a lot of time in Mexico this past year. So Hermosillo in Mexico City, and um, I think I felt this kind of pride. Um, around just our culture in general, the Chicano and the Mexican culture. I really felt this pride, like it's beautiful and and look at it, it's over here, it's over there, and it's this full circle thing of where- it's Worldwide. Yeah, it's worldwide. It really is, man, that, that, the, influ- the Chicano influence and style is, um, we were talking about that earlier, how, how it's really grown. Yeah. I, um, worldwide. Yeah. You know? I, I felt so so that I think that's really like I was like, well, okay, this is my interest and my passion, right? But I've just seen this thing like like bloom. And you know when I went the first time I had gone to Japan, like I said, it was two thousand one. And I think the first time the culture actually got there was around nineteen seventy nine or nineteen eighty yeah, when the first people got the idea for it. So 
there was clubs that got formed probably in 87 um, in Japan. And so I was there, I think I was there like 15 years or so after the movement really took hold. It's been over 30 something years now. So I've been there for more than half the movement. And I've seen the generational handoff even from the original people to the second generation and then the kids too that are they weren't even born when I was there that are born now that are getting into low riding and that's really amazing to see. It's like it's like what we see over here when you see cars passed down through families. Yeah. And that kind of thing. And then, you know, fathers giving their sons Pendletons or or whatever they might be or the kid graduates from the little low rider bike to actually having a car. Yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful thing to see somewhere else. One of the things um, that I remember on the, the documentary, Low and Slow, is um, how Nagoya got a lot of their bombs. So if you can share a little bit of, of that, if you could, uh, just so our listeners can hear, because I was truly in, like intrigued by that and just floored me in my seat to know a little bit of how these other countries uh, you know, got these you know, American cars. You got it. So um, there's a couple of ways that, that cars had, had gotten there, but the most, uh, I think probably what I can I can say with much confidence here. Um, the first guy who, you know, uh, brought a lowrider over um, was probably Junichi from the Pharaohs. Um, and he, he brought over an El Camino and put some hydraulics on it. So they didn't get the bombs yet, but they were just kind of getting the feel for the culture. Um, you know, later they were able to, to get more bombs and cars, but that was, uh, with the help of their, their club. Um, the original chapter of Pharaohs is actually in, um, the South Bay of Los Angeles area. So San Pedro, that Harbor area. And so the oldest club is, uh, the Pharaoh South Bay and it was founded in 1953. Hmm. And Pharaohs Japan is the oldest car club. Um, as well. So they're just they're chapters, right? They're chapters, but they the pharaohs in Japan started um, without permission of the pharaoh South Bay, oh, uh -huh. um, and so the plaque was a little different. Everything was a little bit different. And um, what the members ended up doing is they ended up going from Japan and visiting, setting up a meeting with the pharaohs in, in L.A. And they brought them, you know, their plaque and magazines and pictures and stuff to show them what they were doing. And they asked if they could join the South Bay Pharaohs. And the South Bay Pharaohs said yes. They voted, had a meeting wow. at the clubhouse. What um, year was that, you know? Um, I don't have it off the top of my head. I want to say it was, uh, I think that was in the 90s. In the 90s? Yeah, I, I want to say it was in the 90s because it was for the like at least the 10th year anniversary or something for the Pharaohs in Nagoya. I, I have it in the documentary, actually. It's in an uh, uh, interview I did with Junichi and with the Pharaohs. Uh, in um in san pedro but so they had a lot of help uh because they had car club members on this side of the pacific and they were sending things over but there's also another guy um whose father owned a shipping company and the shipping company would send over japanese cars to the states so like toyotas and nissans etc on these big freighters these freighters would come over they'd unload them they'd sit in the in the bay for like weeks and they'd be empty. They had to go back to Japan. So they got the bright idea of saying, well, why don't we just rent the space out in each of the containers and make some money off it and send it back. It's going back to Japan anyways. And so that's what happened is they started loading up these containers with low riders and parts <sighs> and clothes and other stuff and sending them back. And it was like 800 bucks a container to rent the space. It would take about six weeks for your car to get there. It took about three weeks to get there or, you know, buy it you know, ocean. And then it's out in customs for another three weeks. And then they inspect, you know, they check the panels and make sure you haven't hit anything in there, stuff like that. And then they, uh, then they give you your car. And so that's how the cars got over there. Wow. Yeah. Man, I would just take it all apart so they wouldn't take it all apart, you know? And well, some people did that. I mean, yeah. I'm like, don't be touching my car. I'll, t I'll take the panels all off already. Yeah. And, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So there was a guy, there was a guy who was, whose father owned that company, the shipping company, and he became an um, import-export person. And um, So that was a big deal then, huh? That was a big deal. He, he made a lot of money. And then there was a, uh, a couple other Japanese guys um, that helped. 
that, that one of them moved over uh, to LA and he um, became the founder of Lowrider Magazine Japan. And um, he still lives in LA now and he does shipping as well. He's a good friend of mine, he's a photographer also. And um, there was another guy who's a painter uh, who ended up working for Orly Coca. And Orly Coca was the biggest exporter of um, lowriders to Japan and probably all over the world. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Um, but he uh, he had a Japanese guy who worked for him. He was a really good painter. He still has a shop in Japan. I see him every time I go. I go visit Japan. Um, and he he helped him ship a lot of cars too. I think he said they were sending, um, I think he sent over 3,000 Impalas to wow. Japan easily. Um, yeah. He, That's where they all went. That's yeah. actually where they did all go. They went. Yeah. They, they went there. Yeah, because um, you can't hard. I mean, to, what I understand is it's not that easy to find them right now. Yeah, they might have more. Uh, I mean, you can find one, but it's not that easy. They said, you know. No, yeah, no. they might have more in Japan than they do in uh, in L.A. I think I think most of them are over there. So that was interesting, also too, on the documentary when you talked about um, in Turkey, where all the oh, yeah. uh, impalas are. are uh, if you want to share that, a little bit of that. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, you know, like the Impala, not the whole world didn't look at it like we did. So, you know, we, we looked at the car and said, hey, you know, it looks like this, but I'm going to make it look like this. This is going to be beautiful. I'm going to do this paint. I'm going to put these rims and I'm going to do all these beautiful things to it. Um, to other countries and other places, they just saw them as, you know, a, a means of transportation. So they... Um, they got a lot of four door Impalas in Turkey and they use them as, as taxis and that they're painted yellow and they just bang them up and drive them all over the place, man. That's what they are. Just like the, I the mean, Bel I mean, that's gotta be hard. It's gotta be a hard sight to see just a bunch of Impalas. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been we to Turkey? We weathered and driving around as taxis. Yeah. No, I've been, I've been to other parts of the middle, uh, middle East of that area, but, um, I've, uh, I've I've had a lot of people send me pictures from them that wanted to talk, and I was like, "What? What? It's just crazy." That'd be pretty amazing to see. I mean, I would imagine there'd be like one or two. So, but what? Name like two or three places that you were surprised that they had a lowrider community there. Hmm. You know what? 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 Two or three like countries. Two or three. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll say I'll say. Uh, I mean, I would imagine. I think I mean, Chile. Chile? Chile, yeah, South America, Chile was like it just kind of blew my mind, man. Uh, I th you don't think of that when you think about Chile. You think of like wine or something, you know, Chilean wine and mm -hmm. like the Andes and, and yeah. I mean, you don't think about low riding about in Chile. Oh, so I was really blown away there. Um, you know, I think Japan uh, takes the cake over any of them. Yeah, you you so. mean other, other than Japan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, other uh, than Japan, because I, I and anybody who doesn't know. You know, the Chicano and low riding culture is huge in Japan, you know, right. um, and for those of us that don't, that do know that little bit, um, we all know that Japan's the place, you know, that the biggest, um, um, yeah, I, I've influence I'm, that we had on, on another country, but you said Chile. So I've, I've been to, I've been to a, a bunch of countries for this. I mean, Brazil, I mean, Taiwan, those are all good places. So Taiwan has a, a, a low rider community. It does. It's not that I think they have less than like, they probably have seven cars total in the entire country that are low riders in Taiwan. I think last time I was in Brazil, there wasn't more than 15 low riders in the entire country. Um, but I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go full circle here, man. I, you know, Mexico, I was actually really surprised that there was low riders in Mexico. And, and here's why, you know, in the past, um, and this is super unfortunate. I, I don't support this in any form or way, but you know, there, there was a lot of discrimination between Chicanos and, and Mexicanos in the past. Yeah. And, and that was a very hurtful and I never liked seeing that. And people would say things about each other. They're this, they're that, but you know, that's our roots. No, I think we've um, I think we've overcome that a lot. I think we nowadays, have and yeah. and this is, this is a, an example of that. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, this isn't <laughs> our culture and their culture. This is all of our culture. We're so, really and I, and I think we've all grown. You know, we we can break it down and analyze what happened, but yeah. I think we've we've as a as Rasa have, have come together and, and saw the big picture, and and you know, there's always going to be those people. I agree. But I think in the big picture, I think most people are really accepting of each other nowadays compared to, the, like you said, the yeah. past. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a wonderful thing to me. You know, when I see lowriders in Mexico, 
that's 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 a connection man that's that was never there before and that's that's amazing to me especially how long uh you've been around the culture and you just see that shift yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can you see that and you're you. like wow like this is eye-opening to me you know what i mean this is incredible so i can only imagine like how you have felt that really yeah that from from out of all the countries, I think it's Mexico, uh, next to Japan for me that I really, really liked uh, and been amazed by it. And, you know, the thing of you, you think about it, there's, you look at the names of the cars here, people give their, their low riders, you know, Spanish names, there's mm-hmm. uh, the Aztec or, or indigenous type murals or, mm-hmm. or letters or stuff. And that comes from Mexico. So we mm-hmm. can't deny that. So I always thought yeah. it was like, wow, why are you, why would you say anything bad about Mexico really? And then when we go over there, you know, in the past, they'd be like, oh, they don't like them. They're from the States. They're pocho or they're not one of us exactly, you know, that kind of stuff. And now it's like, if you're in the lowrider scene from here and you go to Mexico, they're, they're happy you're there yeah. and vice versa. And That's not, it's man. great to see what they're doing. I mean, it's like that hit in the hip hop community. Yeah. It's like that in the DJ community. Yeah. Um, I think it's, I think it's an amazing thing and, and um, amazing yeah. times. Like for as far as c- connectivity yeah. and acceptance. Oh man. What, how, how amazing to, to live to see that change. Oh, it's, it's been amazing. You know, even the tattoos. I mean, like, the oh, yeah. I mean, stuff, that's a whole, you know, like, like there's a lot of tattoo artists that go back and forth, but they get influence from here. Mm-hmm. And it's actually cool to see that like, okay, we get that influence from Mexico and we do that on our low riders and our cars and our art. And then they take what we're doing, you know, and yeah. they're influenced by that also. Yeah. And I think that's kind of full circle. Mm-hmm. For me, one of the things um, is because, you know, uh, I do graffiti art and stuff to see as much graffiti that's in Mexico. Uh, and they've just, they, they got um, the spray paint, the caps, the, you know, and that's a, you know, that's an, uh, like, so I'm not saying it's American, but it's, you know, it's a graffiti, you know what I mean? So they, it's everywhere. And it's actually in certain parts, it's legal. You know what I mean? They have like big events and stuff that they have over there. So that's where I started seeing it. Like, oh, Mexico has all these events. I think uh, Juarez, I think, is uh, they have a lot of graffiti and events out there and stuff. Do you, have you seen any um, like events out there, uh, uh, low ready events or anything that, that in Mexico just recently that you've attended? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the last show I went to was uh, not too far from here. It was in it was in uh, Puerto Penasco, Rocky Point. Wow! And they had a big show at the Malacón. That's actually every year. Um, it slowed down a little bit because of COVID, but this year was packed. What, and, what month is that in? Uh, February. February. Yeah, uh, February. So, everybody uh, listening, go check out the car show in Puerto yeah. Penasco in february it's a big luke will be there i'll be there so say what's up to luke if you don't know him just be like hey man i heard your (laughs) podcast so what's up and he'd be like yeah it's all good it's it's amazing man because uh i mean like i said i haven't seen you since 2018 i've learned so much at that time then i see you again right now and i'm learning more again i didn't know all this a lot of these things that you're you're you know uh, that you're talking about like in, in mexico city and some of the um the video clips and stuff that you've shared with us and stuff like you know, always, but see, you're, to me, you're like, uh, you're ahead of us right now. You're traveling, you're seeing a lot of things we're not seeing. Maybe they're not even talking about, you know what I mean? Because you, you don't, I don't know that, you know what I mean? Like uh, if Lowrider Magazine is having something over there, um, if it's represented or or just different things, you know, the culture. And like I said, I'm barely kind of int- getting introduced to the car, car, uh, cult, uh, culture and stuff. And just seeing like everywhere, it's just, it's just amazing to know, like, man, I, I didn't know that. I didn't, I, th- I thought it was just, you know, and uh United States, you know what I mean? And, and, and Japan, yeah. but now all these other different like countries and stuff. It's amazing. But that's actually, um, uh, what I was going to say is, uh, you know, my friends from Mexico city actually came up from Mexico city to Penasco and they brought some cars and they hopped them and they did a really badass job. And wow, that's, they, a drive. They looked amazing. that's a drive. It's a drive. They, it took a couple of days for that. Some of them to get there. They trailered some cars. Some people just flew out. Some of the guys from Guadalajara drove all the way from Guadalajara to, to, uh, Benyasco and, and showed, but the interesting thing here, and this, and this is what I'm uh, going to be, I'm going to be going somewhere this month. Um, there's a car club in Mexico. I was there for their first anniversary. It was in Mexico city called luxurious car club. And they have a chapter in the States, but they also have a chapter in Canada. And the president from the Montreal chapter moved to Mexico city to help set up a chapter in Mexico city. So a Canadian went over there and did that, which was kind of cool. So Canadian went to Mexico city and started a car club. In Mexico City, yeah, is there is there lowriders in Canada? Yeah, there is. A, um, I'm, I'm going up at the end of. Uh, <laughs> she said yes. Yeah, I'm going to say her name. <laughs> <laughs> Siri said yes. I'm, I'm going up to Montreal at the end of the month, 
<laughs> yeah, go to the Montreal man. Head of the Month to yeah. answer. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. I didn't even say anything. I didn't even say your name. <laughs> crazy. Funny. Sorry about that. She's listening to the podcast. <clears throat> yeah, she's listening. Yo, to that's see, that that's amazing to me, man. I'll I'll I'll, I'll based off of the Chicano low riding culture and the culture Mar. here, and uh, guys in Mexico City are doing a great job. And um, I saw some of the Canadian rides and the things they're doing. They're doing a really good job too. It's impressive. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so what do you have in store, man? What are you working on? Got anything kind of cooking right now? Something to come that you're gonna come out with? I do. Um, and so. What you saw in the museum was a was a short version of a, a full length film. Um, you know, I've 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 treated this film like it's a lowrider, like it's a car. You know, you know, you gotta get the right parts for it, right? You gotta get the right paint. You gotta get it exactly how you want it to, and that takes time. It takes money. It takes patience. Um, what I'm doing is uh, the end of September, I'll be dropping the film at a film festival in Dallas. It's a Latino film festival. Actually, Fort Worth. What is it? What is the film festival called? I have it right here. No. Um, I'll have to tell you the name on yeah. the full name, but it's a we'll post it or something. You a, know, it's, it's a Latino film festival. Oh. Fort Worth Latino Film Festival. And I, and I think something. you told me it wasn't going to be the complete film, right? It's going to be part well, of it. No, I'm going to actually show the uh, a full length version. You're going to show the, the full length version. Hour and, and change. And this is next month. This is man, in the next month. I want to play out just to see the full length version that. because I haven't yeah. seen the full length version, man. I'm gonna let all them people see it first, man. Uh, I gotta, yeah. go, I gotta go now. <laughs> bring it back. I'll bring it back here. Yeah, no, yeah. So, so here's what I have in store. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna drop the film, um, yeah, in the next month. And just a little, a little, a little um, alert, man. You know, my man um, has blessed me with the honor of including my music in his documentary. Hey. So you know. He's thank you, too. man. That's a blessing, man. To me, that's a blessing. So thank you. Oh, you man. know, so yeah, that was awesome. I, I'm uh, I'm super excited for the. I mean, I got some great music. I mean, Transo made some good tunes. I got some tunes. Um, actually, um, you might have heard of this group um, called Los Yesterdays. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I was I, I I chatted with uh, with Vic, and um, yeah, they, they he's excited to help. So I'll be yeah. licensing some music from them. Wow. So some nice oldies in there. Um, yeah, I got some other I got some other tunes from some other yeah, Luke needs too. music. Everybody send Luke music. Everybody yeah, send music. Yeah. Um there's some other groups from uh from Texas also that that made some good tunes I'm gonna include. Um I'm not really wanting to put gangster rap in here. I think we have yeah. enough of that negative image. Yeah. Um but I do want to show uh I do want to show everybody the culture, the good stuff about it, and uh, put some good tunes so that people have a, that that good imagery. And that feeling in their head every time they see a low rider going down the street, they feel good and they're they're happy and, and they have a different idea about us. So this is no longer an uphill battle. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It was great, man, how you um put everything together. You know, like like I said, man, it, it's something that um uh that, that I would see um like on A and E man or National Geographic. It, it was that amazing to to see. You know what I mean? Especially when I was sitting around and talked to anybody and I had friends all around me. And I was just floored, you know what I mean, from just everything and just how you visually took it to. I remember this picture specifically. It was at the beach and all the bombs were lined up. Oh, yeah. And they were close, like really close. Like they drive really close up to And I saw a little bit of the ocean and everything. And it just was like bombs. I don't I don't even know, hundreds, uh, maybe a hundred. I don't yeah. know. That was amazing. That was Nagoya. That was a good day. I remember that. Yeah, that was a great day. That was now, 2005. Now, in that, is, is that the Pharaohs? The, that was the Pharaohs, yeah. So, can you only have a b bomb, right? It's a bomb only. It's a bomb only club. Car club? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, 30s through <sighs> 50s. It, you can't go past uh, 57. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's the rules. And then, you know, the, there's a, you know, Impala clubs and mm -hmm. there's all kinds of car clubs. But, you know, bomb, club, bomb clubs are definitely a different scene, I think, than the Impala. Uh, and, and you know, there's clubs that are G bodies and they're hoppers. That's definitely a different mm -hmm. scene too. You get a different vibe for each uh, each kind of club. And I think there's um, I don't know how to. Uh, the, the, I guess there's a a subculture within the culture mm -hmm. in a way, you know. And there's people that do bike clubs and um, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just all like here, lines. just like here, there's subcultures and of of the culture. Yeah, I remember the paint jobs too. Oh. I just, they, they were amazing. They were just pa patterns and everything, just sleek and the glitter and everything. That's just, it was different. It was different yeah. than we typically see, you it's know? A, it's, it's, it, it was definitely different. They did such a good job. I mean, the, the whole Japanese culture and 
in a way is uh they're very very close i think chicano or, or or mexican art culture because they do a lot of things like they're kind of like handmade it's a lot of attention to detail a lot of detail they're they're really good with paint they make just things look vibrant and alive. It gives it like energy. I, I, I think that's very similar to our culture. When you look at, you know, uh, uh, when you go into somebody's house that has their walls painted or the mm -hmm. artwork and, or you go, you know, to buy artwork or something, you're, you're there in those places, you feel a different energy because of those colors and the way it's put together. And I feel the yeah. same way the Japanese do that about their cars. Do they also do uh, the pedal cars and, and yeah. uh, the lowrider bikes and everything? All of it. All of it. Everything, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, like the uh, the Schwins. The guy had a bunch of Schwins. Yeah, I saw that. Things. Yeah. Wow, My friend Lefty had a bunch of Schwins in his uh, in his garage, and the, the ones with the shifters, original stuff, like the crate bikes. Um, yeah, it's amazing. So um, once again, so the, the documentary is called Low and Slow. Low and Slow. Um, by Luke Dorsett. And it's basically documenting documenting our Chicano culture, our Chicano low riding culture influence on the world, the world, and across the country. Yeah, um, amazing, man. You know, for real. Thank you for documenting this. Yeah. I, I I know you said that um, you've been offered to to you know to sell this this idea this to is, some major uh, networks and and. Um, this is this is yours. That means this is ours. You know, yeah. um, mm -hmm. I, I I do really feel that when we do something for for our people, it belongs to them as much as it does to us. So the you know the, I never intended just to make this film so I could just make this like a commercial thing, etc. You know that 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 wasn't this is this has come from love. I mean, this is gonna, this is amazing. I mean, I teach my kids these stories about how our culture has influenced you know across the world. So. This is going to be something tangible that we can pass down to, you know, and sit down with our kids and say, look, you know, just watch this for a minute. And this is part of your history. You know, it's definitely a legacy piece. That, yeah. that, that's what it, yeah. I definitely yeah. appreciate that. I can appreciate it was something like that. Put you know? together uh, very well. I mean, like I said, someone that um, didn't grow up in the car, clo uh, low rider car uh, culture to remember as much as I did off of a film. Uh, it's it's a great film um, a documentary. Uh, please look, everyone, if you can uh, support it when it comes out. Yeah. When uh, it comes out and we have it online yeah. or something like that, we'll definitely yeah. share the link. We'll definitely share it. And because um, yeah. we want this to be out. We yeah. want, we want. Everybody that would explain why I can't find it. <laughs> I haven't put it on. You know what I mean? Like, I, you like, know what? I've, I've been wondering for so long, like, how, how, how long does it take you to make a documentary? Damn it. You know, yeah. but. The perspective you put it in, yeah, it makes sense. It, it, it totally made sense at that yeah. point. Like, well, that's for mine, but yeah, I can't speak for everybody. But yes, yeah, no, 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 yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. um, I get it now. Why it's taking you so long? You, you about the patience, yeah. about having the right parts, right page, yeah. right that makes sense, parts, man. People, so yeah. everything, and yeah. I and I'm excited that we're actually going to see it come out now, man. That's yeah. that's amazing because as long as I've um, since I've met you, not been known about you, but as long as I've met you, you've been working on this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've been doing I've been doing this piece yeah. by piece by piece, and uh, you know I didn't. It's just I haven't been funded by a studio or anything. This has all been my own money, my own funds, my own time, own equipment. So if um, anybody wants to, um, <laughs> if anybody wants to donate to his cause, our cause, to his his um, documentary, you know, this is all. This has been years in the process and years coming out of his pocket. So if somebody wanted to help you, how did they get a hold of you? Just to you know say we want to help fund or do we want to do our help? Uh, in any way hit me up on um hit me up on my social um i got a facebook page uh luke dorsett international film and photography you can look me up by that on instagram uh luke dorsett official um uh, my personal ones the new billy low uh with lo at the end hit me up there um i guess you know i should probably uh should probably hit up cheech marine and let him know that i'm dropping the film because he's in it too Oh yeah, yeah, wow. he is. Like, I, oh yeah, I, I would I, definitely, man. Yeah, hit him I, up and be like, "Dude, you need to go out to the show. Come out." I gotta let him know. I mean, he uh, I helped him out last year. He's uh, a big, he's a big um, Chicano art collector. Yeah, oh, every, a lot of people know that, and yeah, I think he believe he put out a book, and yeah, he has a gallery too. He opened up uh, just yeah. recently too. So yeah. he's yeah. heavily into yeah the the culture. You know, that was a funny. I I, I call I cold called that guy. I got his number from somebody. Really? I don't want to tell you who, but I, I got I got his number. <laughs> I called him on the phone and I, I I pitched the idea to him and I said, "Hey man, this is what I'm doing." He's like, "Well, do you, who do you work for? You work for MTV?" I'm like, "No man, I'm doing this myself." He goes, "Really?" He goes, "Yeah." He goes, well, "That's a 
that sounds cool. All right, let's do it, man. And he didn't charge me for the interview. And, and so that's what like, I knew. I was like, I'm doing something right here. Yeah. I, I got to keep going with it. Wow. I just got to keep going with it. Shout out Cheech for just giving them, giving my man an opportunity, you know? Straight Shout out, out Cheech. Cheech, buddy. Yeah. So where are you going to screen this at? What's the name of the festival? Uh, the name of the festival is called uh, Festival de Cine Latino Americano. And it's in Texas. It's in uh, Fort Worth. And what are the uh, dates? Uh, the dates, uh, the festival starts uh, September 22nd and it ends September 24th. Man, that's around my birthday, man. I think we should go head out there, brother. I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think you should. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you know? Do you, do you wow. know what day or, and or, and or time you're gonna um, be be showing your film? I'm I'm screening the uh, the twenty third. Twenty third. Uh, I want to say that it's in the evening. I don't have the whole uh, itinerary yet from the festival, um, but the festival starts on Friday. They'll be doing some screenings. Mine's on Saturday. It's gonna be kind of a special event. We're gonna have some lowriders parked on the street and like right next to the entrance. And then the following day, um, there's going to be a, a car, a lowrider car show. Wow. Um, and that'll, you know, that'll be put on um, by some, the clubs in Fort Worth. Uh, but it's actually for a really good cause. And um, it's uh, to uh, for the cause of uh, battling against brain cancer. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm really, I'm fully supportive of this. Um, the, uh, the the person who was organizing it had a, had a daughter who had brain cancer and um, and lived through it. And it's close to me because one of my sisters had stage three brain cancers. Uh, luckily, she's still with us and she made it through. And so I support that that show um, on the twenty fourth. One of those things that forces you know, and you're just like, yeah, I got to do this. Oh, I'm more than happy to do it again. My, uh, awesome. My daughter lost her mom uh, when she was eight years old uh, to uh, a brain um, a brain cancer. Yeah, she had a tumor that was cancerous and stuff too. Rest so, in peace. Yeah, yeah, rest in peace. That's awesome that uh, you guys are doing that. Yeah. So I mean, uh, you know. Uh, Another thing, we're just uh, we're about community. We're about giving back, and it's important to do this. Right so um, it's not only about showing off our cars. We want to give something back to the community. Awesome. Um, yeah, people know Be that. Be my example, sure. man. Thank you. Thank awesome. you. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. check it out, man. Um, is there anybody you want to shout out, man? There's been a lot of people throughout the years uh, that have gotten you to this point with us. Uh, your passion, everything. I consider this. You're a gem. Uh, your your film is gonna it, it's a gem. You know what I mean. Is anybody you want to shout out, man, or you know, give some people some flowers or whatever, man? You've seen so many people. You've seen the world, man. Yeah, I'm I'm first gonna start with our creator because without without the creator, you know, this wouldn't have been possible. And and helping me and and catching me from falling all the times that I could have. Um, you know, second is my family, uh, mother, father. My other family that supported me along the way is my lowrider family, all those people. Um, you know, Johnny Aranda, rest in peace. Orly Coco, rest in peace. Yo-Yo, rest in peace. Chino, rest in peace. A lot of people died before I could finish this film. Some people got to see pieces of it. Um, so I'm definitely going to dedicate this to them when I screen it uh, and to their families. Um, and, uh, you know, all, all the people who have supported me with music, um, or with connecting me to the right people that I need to be connected to. Uh, you know, shout out to them. And um, and my homie Spanky from the 304 Posse. <laughs> <laughs> what up, Spank? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, and if I'm going to do that, I might as well say, what's up, Angel Diaz? Because he's going to get mad if I don't. What's up, Mr. Mess? <laughs> what's up, Mess? <laughs> what's up, Mess? Yeah, everybody, everybody else. There's a lot, there's a lot of really cool cats in, in, in Phoenix and LA. I, I, I can't name them all, but. But if y'all are close to me and, and stuff, uh, for sure, this goes out to you. Word, word. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. Uh, it's been an honor having you here. For sure. Um, amazing uh, story. Um, just I'm traveling with you in my mind as you're talking, man. You're definitely one of Phoenix legends, man. Oh. Thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on. And with that said, everybody out there. Support this film as much as you can. Definitely. This is What's Good Phoenix. I'm aware. I'm DJ Tranzo. And I'm Luke Dorset. And we out of here. Peace, Yay. everyone. Thank you for joining us. Oh, we're not going to do the beatbox? Oh, yeah, we're going to do it. Luke in the house. Low and slow. You better know. Yeah. Peace.